So tonight we present three powerful films that explore indigenous history, sovereignty, and land through image and sound. Otono is an award-winning short by director Co Connor McNally. He's Edmonton-based director, and um, his film is a striking example of what is no now called the indigenous new wave is in what we now call Canada. The second film is a classic, You're on Indian Land, that was recently remastered, and, and also it had its credits corrected to finally recognize the work of Mike Mitchell as a director of the project. Jahentineta Horn is a Mohawk political activist and organized who is featured in Your Own Indian Land, and we are particularly honored to have her join us here for the question and answer period after the film alongside Connor. And last but not least, we are extremely thrilled to also share with you one of the formidable documentary futurism films that are part of a project um, we recently launched about a month ago. Tonight, you will see Oyor Hatne, uh, or Tomorrow, and this is a film by Roxanne Whitebean. We are really, truly pleased to bring together and screen tonight a beautiful, this beautiful contribution to indigenous futurism in film, alongside a new experimental work, and of course, a tribalizing film to mark its 50th anniversary. The uh, film said that there was uh, nobody uh, charged. There was one person charged. One, and that was me. <laughs> and I fought for several years. One charge was that I had beat up 23 policemen. <laughs> <laughs> and the other charge was that I was carrying a concealed weapon. And it was a camera knife, and I was taking the air out of the tires with it. <laughs> However, it went to court, and um, I had no money, and I, I had to defend myself. And I, uh, there was a lot of things that came up. One of them was that the land had been expropriated by the city of Cornwall. We only found out when the police showed up and started attacking us. That was the first time we, uh, we heard about it. So anyway, I wanted to bring all of them into the court and to put it on the record. And so anyway, and of course nobody wanted that. Anyway, it, and I didn't have a lawyer, so uh, somebody did show up from Toronto and his name is John Sopinka. And he became eventually um, I guess Supreme Court. Supreme Court, yeah. He was he's dead now. But he came and he, he defended me. And uh, anyway I got off that and I got off everything. So there there are three people here that were that were there. There was Degarundage and my brother here, Tayo And uh, I think we should uh, point out uh, the importance of that film. Um, it is an important film. And uh, because uh, it does recognize uh, or uh, affirms our right to our land as the first people that were cre created and placed here by creation. And when the Jay Treaty was signed between Britain and uh, the United States, two foreign countries, uh, there was a big ruckus at that time by our people. And so they put in Article 3 uh, in the Jay Treaty that said that, that this was not a treaty for us, this was a treaty for, for the people who, who came from somewhere else. And that we, are f we have our freedom, we are a free people in all of Turtle Island. And that is what's important about that film. And it has been shown all over the world, millions and millions of people have seen that film. And uh, we're still having many problems, as you know. And yet, very few people know uh, the historical basis of the whole issue that is portrayed in that film. Hey, my name is Roxanne Whitebeam, and um, that was a special project 
projects, sitting on her little crutch, so it was taking projects to um, uh, feature documentary futurism and creating a new genre. So I'm really happy that I was chosen and um, I was able to participate in that. And I think as um, uh, Ogwen Hawaiian people, that it's really important to listen to the children. And um, I wanted to see what children have and in their minds and the way they engage in their future and how we are um, affecting them today. So, I mean, it, we had a lot of fun on set and um, nothing was staged or planned. All the children just shared organically um, their thoughts and what was on their mind. Uh, yeah, I'm from Edmonton. Um, yeah, I, I honestly, it's... Uh, yeah, there are th lots of connections uh, between time and space across Turtle Island. Um, and yeah, I don't know, with, with my film, uh, it's, it's an honor that it's screened with You Are an Indian Land um, and your film, Roxanne. Um, you Are an Indian Land, actually, they, my film uh, played with it back at Doxa uh, a year ago. And I thought that was a really big honor then, t but now to come here, uh, is, is a whole other step. I just make a comment regarding <coughs> this film and the fact that I think uh, the commemoration that's happening here, um, we have always raised these issues throughout history and uh, every year we have uh, at uh, Niagara Falls on the third uh, Saturday of July we have the, uh, the border crossing. One year we go from the Canadian side and go over the Niagara River uh, to the American side, and then the following year we do it the opposite way. And that's being done. That's been done since 1920. We've done that. So these are the kind of uh, commemorations that we do to remind not just ourselves, but everybody else who we are that we are the, we are the uh, Ogwenhunwe, the people of the land, and that we are here because we're, p because of creation. And uh, we, as, as uh, we've tried to explain to you, and uh, my brother tried to explain about the sovereignty, the dewa de, dewa de tawi, meaning that we are in charge of ourselves. And, and from, from till the, you know, for, for, you know, till the, till we die, we are in charge of ourselves. And then we, the other important thing uh, that was done by somebody in Ganawage, it was the uh, uh, Paul K. Daibo, which is a case that was, I think it was in the 1930s. Anyway, it was a long time ago. He was an iron worker, and he got deported from the United States to Canada because he was an alien. So they, uh, so the men, the iron workers, uh, fought it and it went to the Supreme Court of the United States. And uh, so, you know, they, they said that there's nobody that can interfere with our right to, to travel anywhere in North America. We can go without hindrance. We are a free people. And our freedom is, is supposed to be uh, respected, but it's not being, it's being interfered with. And uh, I think that's a very important case. And uh, anyway, there have been things like that that we have done over the many, many years that m our people everywhere benefited from. Um, the border crossing, well, that was us that fought that and that we got that put in. The situation at that border has not changed. It's just different. Now, what they're doing is they're stopping people and they're harassing them as they come off the, uh, off the island, especially off the island. And they're stopping them for no reason. Now, they're staying within Canada and they're not crossing a border. If you're on Cornwall Island, you're in Ontario, and they come over the bridge and they go through the, the border, that's not the border because they're not going from one country to the other. And yet, they're stopping our people there on a regular basis and they're harassing them. 
And this is something that we're, we're now, my, uh, another lawyer and I are working on trying to fight that and get that into court because they have no right to stop a person come, staying within Canada, not going over the border, going from one part of Canada to the other, but going through this, uh, this, this partition that, that exists, CBSA. They go through there and they're being harassed. And I've had many clients who've been har harassed there for no reason whatsoever. So this is an ongoing thing. And, and I think that what, what uh, um, has really uh, hit the nail on the head tonight is this. The city of Cornwall had police officers that came onto the reservation. Those were Cornwall police officers. They don't have the right to come on an Indian reserve if they're city police. And they walked on there, and they were the ones that were leading the, the arrests. And they were taking people from the island over to Cornwall. Now, they, uh, they were uh, showing us that they, had they have taken jurisdiction over the land. And they, made it in they incorporated it into being part of the city of Cornwall, and this has been a bone of contention for a, a long time, because they want, they want to expropriate all of that land and make it into uh, part of the city, and they would love, and what's really happening uh, uh, right now is that there's an attempt to make all the location tickets, that means the ownership of each of the lands are gonna be under the control of the band council. So that the, the individuals, they're gonna tell the individuals like they've done in the United States. They said, now you have the right to sell land. It's no longer communally owned land, but each individual, each individual, individual lots, they're gonna say, we're gonna give you a location ticket and you can sell it to anybody you want. And what happened in the United States, every time that's been done, the Indians have lost all their land. Because what happens is people come in and they start taking one piece of land here and there. That land is owned communally. All the people own it together. It's not owned by the individual. You can live there, but all the people have to be asked. And this is, comes from a... a, a a, uh, a, the Royal Proclamation of 1763, where it says, in order for a surrender of land to take place in Canada or in, in anywhere in North America, they had, to, they had to deal with the communal group and no individual was allowed to sell the land individually. And so what has happened is they're coming away from the, the Royal Proclamation and they're trying to divide the lands up so that they can be taken over by outside people. And this has happened all over the United States. This has been, this is one of the, the worst things in, the, in the, the, like Nevada and Oklahoma. The Indians have lost most of their land. Now this is going to be, they're going to try to do that in Canada. And this is another fight that has to take place where the Indians are going to say no. There was a proclamation that was made. You cannot take Indian land unless all the people there come to an agreement and only then can you get a surrender. So what is happening now with the children? It's, I, I think, it's, I, I do know, I have uh, many grandchildren, that it is not getting better. It is getting harder and harder and harder for our children. They're cutting, there's cutbacks uh, on education. They're getting less and less uh, incentive uh, to go to school and so on. But I do have one good thing to say. We do have the highest birth rate. So my personal story is that my uh, great-grandmother was uh, a residential school survivor and she died when she was 31 years old and there was a lot of controversy around her death because she was five months pregnant when she died. And uh, they said that she had scars from head to toe from being in residential school and that she graduated from there and aged out and she had children in the Syracuse area. And so she ended up making her way because she was from Akwesasne, she made her way to Kanawage and that's where she met my grandfather, Pete Daibo. <coughs> and she had several other children and uh, one was my grandmother. So she passed away and she
she had a really hard time. She had a hard time to show love. She had a hard time to show love to her family and everything. And um, she ended up dying. And some people say that uh, she did something intentionally to herself. Other people say that she got sick. But from that, within a few years, her daughter, her daughter was only nine years old at the time, but within a few years, she got pregnant with my mother. My mother was almost stolen during the 60s scoop. My grandmother was hidden in a convent, and um, she, they, she almost gave my mother away. So if she did, me, my children, all of us, we would not be a part of our community. I wouldn't be a part of this circle here. And, um, and my grandmother, or my, my aunt, who's 92 years old, she's still alive, saved my mother and brought her back to the community. So then my mother grew up and she became a teen mom. And she had a lot of difficulties and abandonment issues and things like that. And so I ended up uh, getting apprehended and I aged out of foster care when I was a teenager. Um, I was emancipated at 17 years old. So that's intergenerational trauma. And that's the way it trickles through and it stems from the residential schools, it stems from the things that have happened to our people. And I don't like to share my personal sto story all that often, but I think it's really important. And one of the things that's affecting my son today is that he goes to Gariba Nordu at Mohawk Immersion School and children on reserve receive so much less funding than Canadian schools because we don't receive provincial funding. We're federal wards of, the, of Canada. So we only receive federal monies. And so they're immediately born with a disadvantage just by being unguehue and being a child on reserve. But if your children goes to an immersion school, they receive that much less because they won't adhere to a Canadian education model. So we still don't have rights. They still try to force um, an English and Canadian education on the children. And this is, this is how it's trickling down through the generations where it's literally affecting children in the room right now. So I just wanted to um, paint that picture for everyone of understanding. You are young people and uh, you're going to school and the schools don't teach you anything about us. So the schools are all failures because you know nothing about us. Probably this is the first time you ever heard anything about us is in this forum here. So, so that is a big, uh, so there's, and then whatever you do know, it's not even true, it's a fallacy. However, from the very beginning, we fought and fought and fought to take care of our mother. That, that we are dedicated, that is what we're supposed to do and we try. For, 500 years, that's what we've tried to do. And you people got the best of it. You know, you look around, you see all these buildings and whatever, you know. However, you, you manage to, you know, the, the, everything's destroyed. The land, the water, the air, everything. It's becoming so unhealthy. But you got the advantage. You benefited from whatever the deals were. And, you know, looking around at the education that you get. We're paying for that, by the way, from the Indian Trust Fund. However, it's come to the point where you're going to die. It's coming to that point. The unfortunate thing is you're probably going to take us with you. Because, you, you, you know, we, we can't survive when you've mess, messed up. You're, you've messed up everything. <laughs> 